everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I thank God for being here. I thank God for Sister Chippy, Carol Pendleton. I call it Chippy. And thank God for um, the saints of God being here. I just thank God for this opportunity that he had opened his door for me to come and share my testimony with the saints of God. It's not easy telling your testimony sometimes because sometimes I get certain looks at me and things like that, but I have, I'm an overcomer. Well, we all come. We all come out of the word of our testimony. Amen. Amen. So I'm just going to be there. Like I tell people, I don't have just one of them cute testimonies. I have a hardcore testimony because that's where God brought me from. That's where He saved me from. Even growing up in the church as a little girl, I grew up under the pastorship of my grandmother, who has been pastor for over 40 years now, and she raised me in the church. But when we get old, and when we get older in our life, we go through things. Things happen in our life. Sometimes we turn away from the way that our parents have taught us and tried to take us. Uh, I am the author of the book of Cast Down But Not Destroyed. My book sells on Amazon.com. It sells on the and I struggle with writing the book because of how my testimony is and where I did come from. But after all, God let me know. He said, this testimony, he said, is not for you. He said, I didn't bring you out. I did not set you free. I did not keep you here to be ashamed with or to be shameful. He said, I kept you here. When the enemy wanted to destroy you and take you out, I kept you here so that you can be a help to many other women, to many other young girls that's going to go through what you already going through and have been through. And so I begin to pick the pen back up and I begin to write. And I begin to write. And I begin to write. And as the Lord leaded and guided me. But I'm going to just go back to my childhood. And that's when it all started. And I'm kind of, every time I hear you talking, every time I talk to you, I say, wow, God, we are similar, we, we kind of similar of life. Because we both have been through similar things, but even as a child, I was a dreamer too. And God would show me things in my dream, and I would dream certain things. And as a child, you don't understand why you dream certain things. But the older I get, a lot of the dreams that I had as a child, I'm starting to see come to pass today. And I'm starting to, like the songs say, we will understand it better by and by. And over the years, I'm, the older I get, I'm understanding it better by and by. But growing up in a church, I was the oldest girl of my mother. My mother had six kids, but five was my father. And I don't have children, I was the oldest girl, so I went to church. Being in the Emmanuel Pentecostal Church, under the leadership of my grandmother, I was in the church every Sunday. I was one of those church, church girls, because my grandmother was a pastor. I was there sometimes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But as I got older, and I'm going to say it really all started in my teen years. When I turned about 13 years old, I'm going to say, as young people say nowadays, I started to do it. I was still going to church. But I still had some certain friends that I hung out with in school, in the neighborhood. And growing up, being a student at Strawberry Mansion High School, I went through a lot of things. I hung out with the crowd, I got mixed up with the wrong crowd. I went from a straight A student, from, I was a straight A student from elementary school all the way up to high school. But when I reached my ninth grade, here, my grades dropped. I started hanging out with friends, I started going to house parties. I started smoking cigarettes, smoking weed. I became disobedient, not what to listen to what people had to say about my life. People will come to me and say, why not give them a new place up with your grandmother who is a precious baby, a anointed woman of God? Why are you born this way? God hears in your life. Don't you see what the enemy is trying to do? And I had the attitude most young girls have nowadays. You ain't my mother. You can't tell me, do I'm getting wrong. I do what I want to do. And I kept being disobedient. Then my life started going down the hill. Kept going to party, not listening. At the age of 16, I became a stripper. I, I knew how to dance in house parties for years, but this was a little different. But I became a stripper, meeting up with an older girl. I 
started stripping, I started dancing at basketball parties. I started dancing in New York, New Jersey, wherever on the East Coast that I had a place to dance, that's where I danced at. But even while I was still stripping, I still was going to church like it wasn't nothing. The people in the church never knew what I was doing. I was going to the strip clubs on Fridays and Saturday nights and be up in the choir and dancing in church on early Sunday mornings. Come on now, it happens, it still happens today. Got mad because my mother, she found out about my stripping lifestyle so she tried to put stripping on me. So I was at that age where I was smelling myself as they say. So I got mad and I ran away from home. I left my mother's house and ran to my grandmother's house. It was doing that worst year when we had the snowstorm. And I called myself packing bags and I pulled the bus from my mother's house to my grandmother's house. And so my grandmother let me in and she let me sleep on the couch. And the next morning she wakes me up and she said, I know that you came here last night. I was so tired. But she said, do your mother know where you went? And I said, no, I left. I ran away. I said, because I don't want to listen to her anymore. I said, I'm getting grown and I want to run my own life. And she said, if you're 16, you can't run your own life. You're too young. I was so disobedient. So disobedient. Didn't want to listen to nobody. So I got upset with my grandmother. So how my mom came from a range of location to stay here. I stayed with my grandmother from the age of 16 to 18. But in the midst of that, I remember when I was 13 years old, it was a guy in the neighborhood that knew a lot of my family, my friends, and he was a pimp. And he started talking to me when I was 13. And he would always tell me, I know your family and I know your brothers can be able to protect them. He said, I'm not going to touch you until you come to come of age. But for years, he talked to me and got in my head and he groomed me. I never knew he was grooming me for when I did turn up age, what was going to happen to me. But to make a long story short, when I did turn 18, he, he said, your 18th birthday next week, I said, yes it is. He said, well, I want you to leave with me. He said, first we're going to go to Atlanta City for a few days. He said, but before then, I want you to leave and you're going to go out of town with me. And he said, you can stay with me for a while. I'm like, okay, so you think you know somebody for years, you kind of trust me. I went to Atlanta City. Got in the room with him and some of his other peers. Next thing you know, I'm out on Atlantic City on the strip at a hotel. I became a prostitute overnight. Just turned 18 years old. Church girl. Yeah, I did my little stripping thing. I danced at parties, but this was a whole nother situation for me. And at first, it didn't really touch me like that. It didn't, everything didn't really happen until I moved out to Los Angeles. I guess to say, if I get her miles away from family and friends and her familiar places, then I can do whatever I want to do to her. By three days later, I landed in Los Angeles. I stayed in Los Angeles. He set me in a room and warned me about the business. And as he grew me about the business, my first few nights I went out, I was scared. I was like, oh gosh, I'm not used to this. But I kept doing it because he put in my head how much money I can make, the lifestyle that I can live, the clothes, the shoes. When you young, that's all the really young girls see. They don't see their life going downhill. They don't see their life being destroyed. They don't see what the enemy is trying to do to them and tear them apart. You don't get a guy come along and tell you you can make a thousand or two or three thousand dollars in a night. You can wear the latest salon hairstyle. You can have all the jewelry, all the money in the world. You can live in a big house on the hill. You can drive the Mercedes Benz and BMW. That's all they are looking at. And that same picture at the age of 18 was painted in my head. And I fell for it. But I had a praying grandmother in my ah. Ah. I went out to work. A month later is when he decided, okay, now I need Judah and I got it and I got it. Went out to work when I didn't make what he expected me to make. Came home and he asked me, well, how much did you make? He said, well, I talked to a couple of my other parents and they said, they're going to make a lot of money. I had a slow night. 
He said, get up and go upstairs. Before I could get up and go upstairs, I felt him grab me back down the stairs. And he began to beat me. And he began to beat me and punch me all in my head. Now I'm from North Philly. And I'm from the street. Well, Let's I'll keep it real. Here. And I have fought just about all my life. Boys, girls, brothers, and sisters. But when this man told me, I, I, I have felt so in love with him that it hurt it. And I didn't have the strength to fight back. And when I see myself swinging back, not me down the top, you know, whoever raised your hands. And as time went on, the beatings became more severe. I went out to work one night and I called my grandma from the casino. And I was crying and she said, well, what's the matter with you? I said, well, I need to come home. And she said, well, we did you? I said, we lost baby, but I need to come home. And I began to tell my grandmother that I was going through. She prayed with me on the phone. I hung up the phone with her and I got back to work that morning. Went on and went to But she got together with Bishop Lassigan. I don't know if any of y'all know him. On 19 Kentucky, and he's my godfather. He's been my godfather from a baby. And all my grandmother are friends since teenagers. And he got a ticket and flew me home along with my grandmother. I came back home. She sent me to Trenton, New Jersey because she was scared that he was going to come back looking for me. I stayed in the Trenton for a matter of four months. I broke down. And it wasn't nothing but the devil. I broke down and I started thinking, I can't make it without him. Because he told me, without me, you would never be nothing. He put that in my head. He said, if it wasn't for me, you would still be in North Philly, not having nothing, struggling, trying to make it. Probably on welfare with baby daddies all over the place. So when I got, when, I, when God did deliver me the first time for that situation, I began to think, I can't, I had a little struggle. I was trying to go to school, it wasn't working out. I said, I do need him to make it. So I broke down, and it was about Thanksgiving time. I had came home arguing, but it was Thanksgiving, and I called his sister. She said, well, he's coming to town for Thanksgiving. She said, so he'll be here. And I said, well, I'll go to my family house, and then I'll come over here. Went to my family house, left Thanksgiving dinner early. They was like, where you going? I'm like, oh, no, all in my business. Just leave me alone. Still being disobedient. After God has shown me grace and mercy. How many of us is like that? After he showed us grace and mercy. I find myself still doing the same thing that he is trying to deliver us from. When I went to his sister, I was knowing that he was going to be there. Next thing you know, I end up right back with him. Less than a week later, I'm in Florida. We are back on the track down in Florida, selling my body in there. So sometimes, when God delivered us from the first time, the second time, he said, okay, maybe if I allow something to happen to you this time around, it'll wake you up. It wasn't as easy getting out the second time as it was the first time. The first time I was only with him for a couple of months. The second time I went back to him, I stayed in it for about a matter of eight years. Being beat. I went back, I was only going on 19 years old. I, I sat here in Florida and I said, I know I can do this. Went to jail. I've been in jail more than I've been out. I desire jobs today, but I can't get them because if I get fingerprinted, I mess around and go to prison for years. But it's because of his grace and mercy and what he's doing in my life now that he's keeping me. I've been locked up all over this country in just about every state and out this country for prostitution, for soliciting, robbery, grand losses, all types of things. When I went back, I was in Florida, then I ended up back in Vegas, traveling all over the country, selling my body in different states, being told by a serial killer. But I'll make a long story short, because I can't sit there and tell you my whole prostitution career. But I'm going to tell you the main bit. One night I was in Florida and I was servicing a trick. I'm sorry I got to talk like this. I'm saying we got children here, but this is how my book is. And I'm praying for my mind, okay, we still from the certain guy. So after servicing him, I knew he get his money. I took his money while he was in the bathroom, put it in my pocketbook, and I was walking out the door. He came 
And he said, oh, you leaving? I said, yeah, I got to go. I'm trying to flush out the door. He looks at the door, realizes his money is gone, and he came and grabbed me and said, you're not going over give me my money back. And I, I'm a person going crazy and said, take your hands off me, let me go. He grabs me by my neck and tries to choke me. So I pulled out my mace out of my pocketbook, and I said, I swear you let me go. He pulls out of my neck. And he put it to my neck. And he said, if you don't give me my money back, I'm going to start choking I was being a fool. I tried to fight him off. We start fighting in the room. When he went to go take the knife and cut me across my throat. Thank you, Jesus. I put up these two fingers to try to block him out and the knife cut me deep in my feet. I still got the scar. The ambulance, they rushed me to the hospital. My fingers crossed and she I got away from him then. There was one time God saved me from death in that life. The second time I got into it again was in Canada. We got into it with God's hand. Took a razor out the side of my mouth and I worked the streets because they were so big. I would keep a lot of the razor out right here. Trying to help another girl, a friend of mine, out on the track. Took it out with me and went to go cut a girl in her neck when we was fighting. I could have went to jail for life. And I wasn't even in the United States. I was living in Montreal, Canada at the time. But then, a few years later, I was in our Phoenix, Arizona. And I was writing a check, and a guy came up, and it was me and three other girls, and he looked at me, and he said, I want you. Mm -hmm. And I got in the car with him, and he took me to a deserted area. I said, I'm gonna let you have this. I said, normally we go where I wanna go. He said, okay, we got to get in the back. We went to go get in the back of his truck. And he went to go climb on top of me. He pulled out a butcher knife. Put it to my side. He said, don't you move. And I'm laying in. I'm like, get the door open. So I said, Jesus, thank God for the blood. Come on, thank God for the blood. I wasn't a preacher at the time. I didn't know how to whoop. I didn't even really know how to pray, but I knew the call was oh, of Jesus. Yeah. Many a night, I laid in my grandma's bed and I would hear her interceding for the people, and I would just hear her say, God, save them by the blood. Deliver them by the blood. Save them by the blood. While they got on top of me, I said, Jesus. I said, if this is it, take me out of here. I said, let them take me out of here. Because at that time, I basically had an I don't kill what I do ever. He did not kill me, but he did rape me. He raped me and raped me until he could not rape me no more. Took me back, and he explained to me the reason why I did it. Because he said, a girl stole $800 from me the other night. And he said, you look like her. I got fired up mad, and I wanted to kill him. Because I said, he raped me because I look like he might be stole from him. So I'm paying something for what's in my gun, and I was so upset. But that wasn't the one that had me come running back to the Lord. To make a long story short, and I've been through some things in that life, but I don't want to take up too much time, amen? I was in the city of Las Vegas at home. I was on the Las Vegas Strip in New York, New York. And while I was on the Las Vegas Strip in New York, New York, I was sitting top of the casino. And a guy walked up to me and he said, and folks me, said, how you, how you doing? What's your name? I said, my name is Naomi. That was my working job name. And I said, I'm doing fine. And he said, well, I'm looking for a little fun tonight. I said, well, I'm going to be having fun. I'm going to be going through all the tactics and everything. So he said, well, I stayed at the top of the I went to a casino. Come back to my room with me. I said, good. So we get in the room. We talk a little bit. He said, how much do you girls charge these days? So I told him the price. He said, I don't have that much money on me, but I do have that on the so he went to the safe that was in the room. When he bent down in the safe, it looked like he was counting money, and I'm sitting on the bed. Now, honestly, my mind, as we say, something told me, my mind, my foot told me something ain't right. And I started to feel uneasy, but the only thing I seen was dollar signs, because that's who I was. And when I seen dollar signs, something, I had the feeling like, get up and get out of here now. But I said, no, I need my money. So I looked and said, is everything all right? Oh, yeah, everything all right. So we got up. I'm thinking he down at the safe counting money, but he was down there putting bullets in the shotgun. 
When he stood up, he turned around and he had a 45 machine shotgun walking to go over and he came and put it to my head. He said, don't you scream and don't you move. He said, if you do, I'll blow your brains out. So I sat there and again, I'm now going at it. I'm angry and I'm sitting there but I'm scared at the same time. I had so many mixed emotions. He said, lay down. When he laid me down, he said, don't you move. He said, come out the closet. His friend was hot and wanted to walk in the closet in the wall. Friend come out of the closet with another 45 machine gun, put it to my chest. They all got one point to my feet, and I got a machine gun point to my chest. He said, if you make any noise, he said, we will take control lights out of the room. I'm laying here, I'm not going to look the thing. I'm basically numb like a mother. I can't move, I'm just laying there. And he said, I just shot raped and killed the lady. And he said, then you can be next. He said, I'm running all over the country. And I'm thinking like this guy might be telling me that, but I'm scared. He said, I've been running for so long. He said, I've been raped and killed so many women. He said, don't you move or say a word. He said, now I'm gonna rape you. And he said, after we rape you, we gonna take you far out in the desert in Vegas and we gonna blow your brains out and we gonna bury you. So I said, okay. I'm laying here, and he said it to me, a tear began to run down my eye. And I looked up and I said, God, I'm basically telling the devil, you won. You got me. You won. And I said, God, I know I did things, and I know I've been so Okay. 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 But I said, God, I believe that your blood is still saved. I'm blindfolded, can't see nothing. 
we took my feet. Tied up with the tape, took a boat, tied my legs together. I could not move at all. Then he said, you know what, we're going to leave her alone every time I speak together. His friend said, what you mean leave her alone? He said, you never left the victim behind. And she done seen both of our faces. He said, do you know what she can do to us? He said, don't touch me. The guy that raped me bent down beside me. He looked, whispered in my ear. He pulled the tape from off my damn. He said, I don't know what it is about you. He said, but for some reason, I don't feel right and I can't touch you. Jesus. <laughs> God said, touch not my anointing. Thousands of people. 
He said his gun and he hit up in the house. He put it to my head. Now I come home and man that's supposed to love me and adore me beats me and put a gun to my head again as I just got raped and got guns put to my head. I fall up in my home. I didn't have strength in that bitch. I laid there. People of God. And I just cried out, God, why me? Why is you allowing this to happen to me? Why am I going through this? But today now I see. Because this other young girl that's going through the same thing or that has asked me questions. I've been through. How can I get out? What, how, which way can I go? I just spoke to some young girls over at um, Williamsburg High School in New Jersey a few weeks ago telling them my testimony. Another girl in the audience sitting there crying because God had just got her out of the same situation I was born. That's why I struggled with writing the book, but I wrote the book. One of the best selling books on Amazon still at five stars. I just thank God to God be the one for that. I get messages from all over the world, people in Africa, Canada. We want you to come and tell your testimony. How did you make it out? How you how you look? You don't look like what you've been through. Yes. He had beat me so bad over a hundred times. I can't tell you every detail, but I told you the main events in my life. After that last break, I turned into a shell. I didn't care about nobody. I didn't care about myself or the world. I started taking ecstasy. I started smoking cocaine. I still went to work day and night making hundreds of thousands of dollars for him. But I was just going through the emotions because prostitution was like second nature to me. I was just going through the emotion. Sometimes I was so out of it, high on ecstasy and cocaine and popping pills and high off of alcohol at the same time. I didn't even know what to see what I was in or what I was doing. My Lord. I told myself after that last week, the love of my life don't care, the man that raped me don't care, my family don't care. I even said God didn't care. And my grandma would tell me on the phone, don't you blame God for what you've been through. She said that was your mistake. But she said he's able 